everybody. It's Rob Benedict. And I am Richard Spate Jr. And we're talking about Supernatural Season 3, Episode 11, Mystery Spot. Mystery Spot. What spot? I don't even know. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. Okay, so for those keeping a score at home, as actors, right now, the score is Richard Spate 2, Rob Benedict 0. Yeah, well, this score changes dramatically as the years go on. Well, we don't know that yet. Spoiler alert. We don't know that yet. So this is your second episode as the trickster. Yep. And we'll get into all of that. But first, let's... uh, Uh, Let's do this summary. Ladies and gentlemen, Rob Benedict summarizing from memory, episode three, (laughs) sorry, episode 11 from season three, Mystery Spot. Go, Rob. It's Tuesday. Is it not Tuesday? It's Thursday. No, but in the, the, it's important to say that about the episode. Oh, 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 sorry. You're so good that I can't tell when you're not doing a summary and when you are doing a summary. (laughs) Literally, it's seamless. You're just mean. It's Tuesday and Sam and Dean are in Broward County, Florida. The bros... Or in Broward. Broward. Oh, Broward? Broward County. That's how you say that? Broward. I apologize, America. It's spelled Broward. It's a couple of bros in Broward. You know what I mean? It's Tuesday, and Sam and Dean are in Broward County, Florida, eating breakfast at a local diner. Dean orders pig and a poke with a side of bacon, and Sam orders a short stack. I'm surprised you didn't say pig and a poke with a side of basson. I almost did say poke, I have to say. (laughs) Looks like poke. You're non-American uh, son love of a... That, I love that poke. They come across an article about a man who disappeared at a local tourist attraction, the Broward County... Oh, God. <laughs> this is why This is why we can't put restrictions on firearms, because everyone wants to kill you. Is it Broward? Broward! <laughs> the Broward County mystery spot. While the brothers search the site, the owner believes they are there to rob him, and Dean accidentally gets shot and killed. Suddenly, the two wake up back in their motel room, reliving the same moments. This time, it's Sam, but it's spelled here as Seam. This time, Seam tries to prevent Dean's death, but Dean gets hit by a car and dies. Bummer. It's Tuesday again, and they wake up in the same motel room, reliving the same moments. Each time, Sam remembers all the previous days, but Dean doesn't. And he always tragically dies, despite Sam trying to keep him alive. Dean gets attacked by dogs. He gets a piano dropped on him. He gets electrocuted. He chokes on a sausage. He eats Boy, a- if you had a nickel for every time you choked on a sausage. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> <laughs> he, he eats a taco that uh, tastes funny. He dies over a hundred times. Sam is suffering because he believes he's stuck in a time loop and can't figure out how to get out. Finally, Sam puts the puzzle pieces together and figures out that the handsome trickster is back. And at his fighting weight, I see. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) Sam tracks down the trickster and confronts him. He tells Sam that he isn't trying to get revenge. He's trying to teach Sam a lesson, that he can't save Dean from hell. Sam threatens him. The trickster gets frustrated and with a snap of his fingers, removes the time loop. The brothers wake up and it's Wednesday. They start their day as normal, but when a mugger shoots and kills Dean, the day continues and Sam wakes up the next day on Thursday. Sam becomes very focused on finding and killing the trickster. It seems like just, overkill, you know? Yeah, well, I don't know. I'm ready to <laughs> ready for that to happen. He spends the next six months searching for him, killing other monsters along the way. Bobby finally gets a hold of Sam and tells him he's figured out a summoning ritual to capture the trickster. Sam shows up. Bobby tells him the ritual requires a human sacrifice and tries to convince Sam to kill him to save Dean. Sam figures out that Bobby is actually the trickster. Sam convinces him that he and Dean won't pursue him if he lets the brothers go. The trickster, the trickster, claiming to now be bored with his little game, returns Sam and Dean to the original timeline alive. The brothers wake up in the same motel room and Sam reflects on his experience. Ah, fade out. Fade out. Well, that was a wonderful summary. And now it's time for... Give me a second. R, R, R. Rob and Rich Review. Robbie, you dive in. Look, first of all, it's a classic. It's a classic. This is one that this is one that I've I feel like I've seen most of this episode, but it was great to see it again, and yeah, man, certainly great. with this perspective of you know seeing you come back. I had a lot of questions, so I have a lot of questions that we'll get into later. But I love it. I think uh, if there's a lot of great comedy in there. Oh. Gold, gold. You know, Dean dying the different ways. And I think, honestly, Jared, as Sam, puts in one of the best performances he's done yet. Like, I love him. It's very nuanced, him sort of getting deeper and deeper into this well of, you know, reliving the the, the time loop and the frustration and, 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 and just the agony of seeing his brother die over and over and over again. Yes, he's great as Sam. Jared is great as Sam. But how is he as Seam? As Seam. 
It was outside the box. I uh, I did I did take notes. Oh boy! Everybody, grab your pillow, fluff it up, and get ready to snooze yourself to sleep. It's time for Rob <laughs> notes. Okay, only I have two on this one. One is that early on, there's a hallway. Oh, is there? He's walking down a hallway, and I swear it's the same hallway in the dream a little dream of me from the last episode. It really feels like the same hallway. This sounds like a personal attack on Jerry Wanick. No, it's not at all. It just seemed like a similar hallway. And the other is, why is why are you why do you get away? You, Richard Spade, get away for kill, killing Dean over and over and over again. I wasn't really killing him. He kind of killed him. Yeah, but do you, did you not watch the episode? I didn't. wasn't really killing him. Otherwise, he wouldn't be alive the next day. Uh, still, people love Dean, and here you are killing him. Well, I'm also clearly beloved because I am allowed to get away with it. <laughs> and that's the real mystery spot. <laughs> <laughs> that's the real mystery, exactly. <laughs> and scene. <laughs> um, no, it was great. It was awesome. And it's one of those episodes. It's a classic. It's a classic for a reason. I love the idea of Groundhog Day. I've always been a fan of that movie. And 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 there's another movie. There's lots of movies that do this. Right. A movie called... Uh, Inception. There's a horror movie that does this as well that I really like. Groundhog uh, Day. Yeah. Oh, bloody... Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, bloody happy splatter. birthday to me or something like that. Uh, happy birthday to you. Speaking of you, happy birthday to Jensen Ackles, who Jensen just Ackles. Uh, recently had a birthday. His birthday uh, yesterday. Yesterday, we recorded our interviews uh, with Jim Beaver. It was on Jensen Ackles' birthday. So in a way, this podcast was done on Jensen Ackles' birthday, only not. That's right. Okay, so enough about me rambling on. How about you, Richard? What do you think of the episode? Not a fan? Classic is not a strong enough word. I mean, oh, boy. Th- there are, you know, the, the the series finale of MASH. Oh, man. Uh, the the pilot of ER. Um, the first, first time on television we saw Don Knotts meet Andy Griffith. There are moments in TV that you can literally... Mark time and the progression. All refer- Can you have a reference past 1980? <laughs> okay, hold on. Uh, In Petticoat when, Junction. When- okay, when, <laughs> how about when Ross brought out the monkey? How about that? Okay, tough okay, guy. There you go. Um, better. Well, hey, how about this? When you when you were in a banana hammock and in, in, in Threshold or whatever show you wore that yellow Thank speedo you. in. Thank you. Now you get it. <laughs> there are there are things in TV that should be honored and held up as 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 social and emotional benchmarks for the nation. And I believe uh-huh. this is one of those shows. Yeah. Well, one of those episodes. There you go. Well, you're, you know, it's great. Strong, strong, positive uh, review from Rich. Um, yeah. yeah it's all, look, this is always, this episode's in the top 10 people's favorite episodes. And, and uh, I can see why. Any other sort of, you know, taking yourself outside the fact that you were actually in it, do you, do you appreciate it? You know what's cool? Okay, so so here's what I think is cool about this. I think it's a clever idea. I think it does what Supernatural does really well, which is bring in the humor in a way that also has a dramatic through line. I mean, Super you know, dramatic. It, I mean, Sam's dramatic, way dramatic. You know what I mean? Right. Sam does, doesn't get the joke. He's But, but the upset. comedy of the way they have Dean die over and over again is super genius, so super funny, clever. Yeah. The taco, I mean, that's just classic. Yeah, so at, from an editorial standpoint and a, and a cinematic execution standpoint the humor is right there the drama is right there that's so hard to balance we take it for granted supernatural does it so well and so often that you go yeah that's the show but dude there's no show out there doing that like that's a yeah. really hard thing to to pull off so yeah. i am always impressed by what they pull off the the uh kim manners factor can't be overlooked the fact that he helmed it and just personally, on a personal note, I was thrilled to be able to work with that guy. And even more so after the fact. And I, you know, I, f- I forgot because we've talked to so many people about Kim Manners and you don't really usually weigh in. You're like the Mr. Weigh In guy and you don't usually weigh in and we get into it later in this podcast. But I, it was one of those things where I was like, oh, that's right. Richard worked with him. Yeah. Well, the part of the reason I don't weigh in is I don't really feel like I have the right to weigh in because I didn't, as much as this is a trickster episode, the trickster isn't in it that much. I wasn't shooting that much in this mm-hmm. episode. Yeah. So that yeah. like, I, I didn't spend eight days yeah. in the trenches with him. You know, right. I think I did two days or something. So right, right. I got to meet him and I got to see a little bit of his stuff, but I I didn't get the real front row seat that a lot of these actors get when they get to spend a full eight days with Kim. Yeah. I just feel very fortunate that I got any days with him and, and yeah. do an episode that yeah. he directed. And I did pick up on his bits, which again, I won't repeat now because we talk about it later in this show yeah, yeah. with Jerry. But yeah, you know, I, I got to see firsthand his style and, Meet the man and understand him a little bit uh, from That's a great. peripheral standpoint. Yeah. Oh, great. The only thing, you know my big beef with this episode. You know my big beef. And I can bring it up. I talk about it again with Jerry, but I'll bring it up. I was the size of a house. I had a lot of sympathy weight on me from uh, JC being pregnant with Fletcher. And uh-huh. just watching it on TV is, is still painful to this day. 
<laughs> you look like a uh, like a linebacker. You did. I mean, you yeah. you have to watch it and go, ooh, rich. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't. I did not think that. But then when you said that, I was like, I guess you know, you just look. You look younger. Your your face is maybe a little puffy. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you no know, beard. So, I mean, look, I've got no little puffy. Anyway, so this when from I, a total I mean, ego Roman. narcissistic standpoint, I'm like, eh. But from yeah. an episode standpoint, you know, look, it's a super clever episode. Jeremy Carver writing it, one of the best. One uh, of the best. Gone on to great things. Kim Manners, a legend. Yeah. And this, the you know, you just get Jared and Jensen doing what they do super well, which is balancing comedy and drama. And a young. Chunky Richard Spain. <laughs> Chunky is the word, baby. <laughs> a lot of rich to love in this episode. I, 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 I'll tell you, I know I said it before. I'll say it again. The machete had a visceral, audible reaction when she saw me on TV. <laughs> and it wasn't, it wasn't, ooh. It wasn't, oh God. It, it wasn't a traction face. It was like, oh, Lord. All Who's right. <laughs> yes. I thought you said you were in this. Um, all right. It's time for the, uh, it's the time to pay the beard piper. That's a weird one. That's a weird one. I was waiting for you to just mock it. I'm going to give it the Kenny Loggins and his, his just vintage best Kenny Loggins, late 70s, Loggins and Messina, Loggins. Yeah, I, and I got to go with the Stapleton. I mean, I, I could pick it apart because of my own ego, but in terms of just a bird's eye view of an episode of Supernatural, it's great. It's so well done. It's Kim Manners. It's Jeremy Carver. It's comedy. It's drama. It's it's everything the show does incredibly well. I'm going with uh, the Stapleton. So that's a, a solid round of reviews from Robin Rich for Mystery Spot. Wow. So Richard, uh, you're two for two in your episodes. I mean, you really liked both of your episodes. I did. I'm a big fan of my work. <laughs> uh, you and I are both very lucky in that we got in some cool episodes, man. Like for you sure. know, we got lucky. And uh, granted, there's a lot of great episodes of Supernatural, but there's absolutely. A, no, I, we, we did. We did. And uh, I think that's why we're here today. Indeed, I do. All right. Jerry Wanick is such a great guest for this episode, serving as production designer and producer on the series for all 15 seasons. He's a great friend of ours. And this episode looks so cool. And it's all because of him. No, no, nobody else is involved with this episode. But we've also got with us the trickster himself, Richard Spade Jr. Jerry and Rich, thanks for being with us. What? Hey. Uh, I didn't hey, realize I was being interviewed on my own show where I interview people. Uh, J- Jerry, thanks for doing this, buddy. Really appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. You know, especially the, the, this is such a classic. It's classic. It's, it's, you know, the pedigree starts with, uh, you know, you got Jeremy Carver as a writer. Yeah. You got Kim Manners as a director. And then you get a strong appearance by the trickster. Oh, yeah. So, man, that's gold. It's gold. And Richard, Richard kills Dean. I mean, the trickster yeah, comes in over and over and over. There's no heart. Just <laughs> cruel and yet joyful at the same time. You know what I mean? Yes. Let's dive right in because you're working with Kim Manners on this one. And so this is a question sort of off the script a little bit, but obviously you always put your best foot forward for everything. But but you obviously developed a relationship with certain director, directors, Bob Singer, Phil Segresha, and Kim Manners in this case. Did Kim require more or anything different than your other director buddies like was he was his approach different in that regard well one of the main things that was unique to kim manners as far as his approach was whatever you showed kim as far as a set a location whatever you know he immediately started working it which meant like in the you know sort of like in the realm of hollywood the Adage is don't show the director your best choice first. Show them number three. Then you go, oh, but wait, we got number two here. And then you just go like you floor him with the third one. You know, if you have three good options, by the time you get to three, he's overwhelmed and it's great and you're off to the races. So, you know, with Kim, you take him to a location. And sometimes it's just, you know, you you go see locations on the fact that this one's the closest. And then we're going to go you know, hop on the bus and go to the next one and the next one. And I remember we were doing this uh, big sequence and it wasn't my first choice for a location. And Kim, by the time we got out of there and I said, okay, now we're going to go, Kim, and I'm going to show you one I really like. He goes, what are you talking about? He goes, I have this whole sequence blocked already, you know, because, <laughs> and Kim was that good too, you know? I mean, right. Kim would get in a set. And we're going to do a 50 50 with a 35. Then we're going to come, you know, I mean, he would just like rattle this stuff off. And it wasn't sort of like film speak, it was exactly what he was going to do. I mean, he right. had it so dialed in that um, either it was going to work and he made it work, or, you know, you just say, this ain't it. But that's a crazy skill, by the way. Oh, that's not normal. <laughs> 
That's a really oh, crazy no. skill. I, in fact, I thought it was a parlor trick. I mean, I'm not kidding. I mean, like the first couple of times, I'm just going like, you're not kidding, you know? Wow. Because right. especially when you have Serge and you have the other camera dudes there and they're just nodding going like, okay, yep. All right. I get it. Wow. And I'm going like, I don't, I have, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about, but, right. and a lot of the guys like Kevin, a lot of the crew, uh, Dolly, Dave, of course, Right. They had spent extensive time with Kim on X Files. Yeah. So they were used to his that rapid fire and what he was up to and um, how locked in he got. So yeah. So they were just like you know they were just like okay and you know they were off to the races. Yeah. Um, but uh, that was a very you know, you know Kim, Kim had you know a lot of incredible unique uh, talents and characteristics, but that was one that. Um, I still shake my head because it was, I, I just never saw it before. Well, I just, and I just want to paint a picture for other people who are listening and not in the industry who are not as seasoned to say a uh, 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 Rob Benedict is that even your best directors, your best, most veteran directors usually don't have a lens choice in their brain two weeks before the shoot. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. usually something you kind of figured out on the day and everything I've ever heard about Kim, what you've told us, what other people have told us is that he had beat by beat set up for specific lens. And I can speak to this about this episode specifically. There's the shot where I morph into the trickster morphs back into himself. He's pretending yeah. to be a, a gray haired man and the boys corner me in the back of the restaurant or the back of the wherever and hold me up and say, what are you, you know, tell us who you are. And then I morph into the guy. I'm like, oh, come on, fellas, lighten up or whatever. There's a, there's a crane shot for that. That's a shot that's, goes down on the line or goes up. I can't remember, yeah. but it's just the carrying right above me. Yeah. And we line it up and Kim's like, all right, say that you're going to say that line. So I'm like, oh, come on, fellas. Cut. Okay, moving on. I'm like, wait, really? You don't, you don't want me to do the lines before and after? He's like, nope. I just wanted the crane for that one line. I'm like, whoa. Wow. <laughs> I was like, that, yeah. that's specific, you know? Wow. Yeah. 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 He already had edited the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. Wow. And, you know, we had a lot of really talented directors. I mean, you know, uh, Richard named several of the top ones, you know, between Phil, John, Bob, you know, uh, Eric, when he directed. Nina, uh, Amanda Tapping. We had some like, yeah, you know, now, we ran the gamut. But as far as like, especially in this one, because there were so many, many beats within every take and you were kind of duplicating the action. But at the same time, you needed a fresh reaction to whatever that beat was. Because, you know, we're doing Groundhog Day and it was just ingenious when, you know, the song would play and then Sam would wake up and you'd be just a little bit different. You know, something's off here. And then, you know, and then uh, Jensen had it remain the same. His his response had to stay consistent. Yet, right. you know, they were uh, it was a different take. And uh, yeah, that was it was crazy. It made my head spin watching it, actually. Wow. Because when we were well, when we first got that script. Because it's all vignettes. It's all like montage. You know, it's all these little, little beats mm -hmm. with all these, you know, little pieces. Mm -hmm. And yet to keep all that straight and, and to get great performances. And uh, the other thing that really um, got to me was the fact that by season three, now the boys really were in each other's pocket as far as like, you know, they knew their characters so well that they could basically, you know, take over each other's lines. And, and the timing was just great. And, you know, some of those scenes where they're brushing their teeth or, you know, when the the, alarm, the, the radio goes off or yeah. that comedic timing was was right there. And yeah. it yeah. was, that was really fun to see. Yeah. Uh, did they how did do you guys remember how they shot? Like, for example, Dean's reaction every morning, he, the song comes on. He's like, oh, yeah. You know, he's doing yeah. his head, bopping his head back and forth. Like, was that the same take over and over and over again? Or did he reshoot it for every, do you know? I don't know. I, I, I wasn't there for that stuff. You know, and, and I wasn't either. I think, uh, I think it was some of both. Yeah. Because it, most of those were clean of Jared, right? right. It wasn't right. like, you know, exactly. like over Jared to him. So yeah, yeah for, but, those, for those listening, Jerry, let me interrupt for, for that terminology. When Jerry says clean of Jared, that means if you're doing a, a shot of Jensen, you, dirty means you might feel a piece of Jared's shoulder looking at Jensen or the back of his head. Clean means it's just on Jensen. So there's yeah, no not in it at all. other body tied into it, just so people at home. So it's easy to come back to that shot if you want to create yeah. what he did. Jerry, what about the challenges of making Toronto, Canada look like South Florida? Vancouver, Canada? Vancouver. I'm sorry. I have, I'm reading my notes here. Yeah. <laughs> 
funny you should say that because I did another movie that took place in Florida that I did in Toronto and it was okay then tell us that answer <laughs> yeah, that's, that's yeah, what the question's great. about it's so easy <laughs> because you know the Lake uh, Ontario there looks a lot like the Atlantic of course you know? a couple of plastic palm trees and it no it didn't work uh, but <laughs> By that time, because we had no standing sets, this is still three, season three. We had we didn't have the mental letters. We didn't, you know, we went to Bobby's once every five episodes or, you know, what have you. So we were used to creating that vibe, whatever vibe they wrote to, you know, every week. And we just, and this is a great example of, there was a, a really smart, nice guy at Warner Brothers when we first started that was going to make a deal with Motel 6 so that every episode, because Motel 6s are everywhere. So instead of staying at these iconic motels, we would be at a Motel 6. That would suck. And no offense to Motel 6 people. No, but um, it would have been a different show, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Because the, we set the sense of place usually through our motel rooms. There was usually some motif within the motel room that told you you were in, in this case, Florida with our flamingos and things like that. Right. And um, that would have just been crazy because... It would have have been terrible. Let's just be honest. It would have been terrible. You know, one one of the great things about the sets you build, Jerry, is, yeah, they they indicate uh, location sometimes, sure. But they also are... Like they're as wild as one's imagined can be. That disco themed hotel you did a couple of seasons ago or season yeah. two with Phil. You just yeah. crazy crap. And yeah. some themes, you know, you and I would talk about themes for the wallpaper and like you would have these ideas. Like to, if you just shot it in a motel, I mean, that would take a, a lot of the fun away for lack of a better term. Well, and also Motel 6 sets. is a chain, right? So it's essentially the same motel over and over and over again. It's, just, you know, it's right. like McDonald's. Yeah. Great, great and reliable if you're, you and your kids are on a road trip. Not yeah. great for a TV yeah. set, right. you know? No, no, you know, it would, it would, it would have been uh, tragic. Yeah. To say the least. And in this one, we had two motels, right? So uh, just as a, you know, looking back, we did 176 different motel rooms in wow. our 15 years. So wow. That's, that's plenty. Yeah, that's a lot. And uh, I also, I because I, I don't remember until I rewatch it again, as far as like some of the little things. But so this was Phil's Diner. You know, the one the diner they were at was called Phil's Diner. Right. Uh, named after Sagrisha. And, um, you know, but, but Kim, I just couldn't believe how well he concealed the, you know, the impact. And and the stuff the 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 way uh, you know Jensen was going to die because you know I, I immediately go back to reading the script and going well this is just dumb and this is dumber and you know but some of our best scripts like the French Mistake and and that w- were also read like okay we're either going to be canceled or it's going to be fantastic yeah. and luckily by everybody just really committing to it we we pulled it off and it yeah. became they became uh, you know classic episodes yeah but I mean this certainly is one of them. These tacos taste funny to you? That's, I mean, that's so yeah, genius. Yeah, that's a classic. Oh, classic. it's, it's a, just so good. And uh, then, the, you know, the golden retriever, you know, yeah, <laughs> totally. turns, turns into Cujo. The, the piano, yeah. which you were expecting anyway. You're like, uh-oh, the piano's yeah. coming down. Uh, well, yeah, but even that, when it happened, because I, I was waiting for it, waiting for it, but, you know, the way Kim shot it, yeah, it was still like, oh, you know, yeah. you still jump in the, yeah. in the car when they, when he, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really well done. It's yeah. so clever and funny and not easy. You know, when you've got to repeat things, to Rob's point, sometimes you're just using an, an edit. Sometimes you're reshooting the thing multiple times and trying to replicate what it felt yeah. like. You know, that's not easy to do, Robbie. Right. right. No. And yeah. um, as we got into the story and Jared started questioning and Jensen started kind of believing him that this was, he was in a loop. Then his performance has changed subtly every time, mm. you know, because Sam would try to disrupt the yeah. chain of events so he could try right. to, you know, crack it. Yeah. Sam, yeah. Uh, uh, Jared does such a great job in this episode, too, playing that. Because that's a subtle thing, too, just slowly getting darker and darker and darker, yeah. you know. Living no, that was, uh, I think this was one of his strongest episodes. I mean, yeah. you know, the scenes with you, uh, Richard, were fantastic, you know. Yeah, I mean, and I think, I think, I think you could all say, like, I think I bring out jared's best you know what i mean i, mean, well, I, think, I think it's so. really a tip uh, that's, a nod yeah, that's to me. Now we got to go to commercial no um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and jerry is it, you know i thought about it with this episode so there's blood splatter every time dean dies is yep. that a pain in the butt for redressing your set yes always <laughs> uh, oh everybody has a 
an idea of what real blood's supposed to look like. And we had all these different kinds and who's going to take, you know, is that going to be Randy special effects or is it going to be props? You know, it just, it's always a big bony contention as far as like, and how does it splatter? And, you know, there's some that stains, some that doesn't, you know, is it dried blood? It, it just, yes, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's never, never a lot of fun. Yeah, no. I bet. Hey there, this is Richard Spate Jr., and I hope you're enjoying the episode. But we need to pull over for a few seconds for some messages. Hey, this is Richard Spate. You know what? It's 2024. It's a brand new year, and I bet you made some New Year's resolutions, and I bet one of them was to eat healthier. Well, you can get cranking on that resolution right now, my friend, with Factor. Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, the prep work, the cooking fatigue. I'm getting tired just talking about it. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more, plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you will have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart this resolution off right. Forget frantic lunch prep and rush dinner making. That stinks. Factors two-minute meals, yes, I said two minutes, are your secret weapon in the new year. You get to fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals all delivered right to your door. It doesn't get any easier than that. And Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep you going no matter what's on the schedule. So I know what you're asking. Rich, how do I tap into this Factor magic? You head to factormeals.com slash SPNTAN50 and use code SPNTAN50 to get 50% off. That's a lot off. That's code SPNTAN50 at factormeals.com slash SPNTAN50 for 50% off. Make that resolution happen now and make it happen at a discount. Fantastic food that's healthy and delicious and delivered right to my door. Now that is how you start the new year off right. The biggest winner in the big game could be you, thanks to BetMGM. The king of sportsbooks is offering new customers a chance to score $158 in bonus bets instantly. That's right, instantly. Just download the BetMGM app and sign up using bonus code VEGAS58. Then place a $5 money line wager on the big game you'll receive $158 in bonus bets instantly, regardless of your wager's outcome. Don't miss your opportunity to cross the goal line on the money line as pro football's top teams clash for the championship. Can't be in Vegas for the big game? Then bring the big game excitement to you with the king of sportsbooks. BetMGM and GameSense remind you to play responsibly. See BetMGM.com for terms. 21 plus only. Iowa only. New customer offer. Subject to eligibility requirements. Rewards are non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in seven days. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-BETS-OFF. That's 1-800-BETS-OFF. Thanks for listening. Now, back to the episode. And then what, what was the Cowboys versus Packers football prank? <clears throat> Oh, that was funny. You know, I, I've given the boys a hard time because at that time, Green Bay and Cowboys were really competitive. Uh, you know, they were both the top teams in our division. So there was a big Packer Cowboy game. It was a Monday night football game. And I had the art department make up all these Brett Favre masks. So when Jensen came out of the door of um, this this body shop or whatever we were shooting in, you know, all of a sudden, everybody in the on the crew had a Brett Favre mask on, and then we just <laughs> you know, go from there. But awesome. um, yeah, that was, that was fun. Yeah, and, and you know, the other thing that what happened, and one of Kim's other real talents was how at ease he made all the talent feel. And there was a point where you know Jared and Jensen both looked at Kim as like you know best buddy and father figure at the same time. But they had so much trust in Kim because, you know, without Kim, I, I don't know. 
it would have, uh, again, you know, he came in about, he came in, I think our third episode and there was a change. I mean, it was really a change. He immediately got a pulse of what was going on and he started implementing what, what he knew, but it, it was really the change from the confidence of the boys and the rest of the crew had worked with Kim and everybody all of a sudden got on the same train. You know, Bob, in his episode, when the boys, um, we did the airplane deal, that was like the first time the boys started picking up on each other's vibe as brothers, as far as like finishing each other's sentences and getting comfortable. And then, you know, on every Kim episode, there was always fun because, you know, they love to pull pranks on Kim and then Kim would get them back, you know, <laughs> you know, a lot of levity. Yeah. Um, but he also pulled off some of the best episodes, right? Yeah. You know, his, yeah, and he was really such a glue, like you're saying, that, that held everything together for these first several seasons. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the and, Brian, you know, Brian Epstein of Super, <laughs> Supernatural. Yeah, yeah. No, he, you know, and, and I remember the first driving on the van after Kim did one episode, and then he was coming back for two, and he was going, yeah, you know, you know, Peter uh, Roth really wants me to come up here and, uh, you know, take over the show as producer, director, and but I think that'd be great, Kim, you know, you've been up here a lot, da 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 Luckily, that all worked out. They made a deal, you know, and um, that could that not was, have been cheap, by the way. I mean, they must have Peter Roth must have wanted him badly because Kim would not have just hopped up here for nothing. You oh, know? No, no, he did very well. Uh, he did very well. But, um, you know, Peter knew what he was up to, too. Right. Because um, the other thing that happened was because Kim was such a legend. So all the other directors that came up, because, you know, you have producer directors and, and directors that come up, well, you know, they either challenge that notion a little bit or, you know, who are you to tell them what to do? You know, they want you out of their soup bowl. With Kim Anders, it wasn't really like that. They just, they were just so happy to get to, to jam and collaborate with Kim. I mean, Charles Beeson was like, you know, like a puppy dog. And, and that's a big time director and a very accomplished director, but he just loved, you know, hearing what Kim had to say and, and like in our uh, prep meetings and stuff like that. And he would pull me aside and go, oh, isn't this great? We still work with Kim Manners. And, and I go, yeah, yeah, it's really That's cool. That's really you know? neat. And, and I got to be like really close with Kim because Kim and, and Marlene and, and my wife, Nan, uh, we all went out a lot. We, you know, we just went to dinners a lot and, and, uh, you know, Nan and Marlene hit it off really well and Kim and like, you know, always got along. So that, that was really special. In fact, Kim bought a house in our hometown in Manitowoc, uh, just oh, before, wow. yeah, just before he passed away. But, wow. um, so yeah, it was, that was, uh, that was one of those great things that happened in this business, uh, you, you know, friends for life and, and, uh, it's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, man. So there in the football prank you're talking about, yeah. the, when you would make their trailers up with, with gear from the Packers just to piss them off. At one point I was in my trailer and somebody said, a PA came by and said, hey, Jared and Jensen would like you to join them in their trailer to watch the football game if you want to. I'm like, well, that's mighty nice of them because I'm just sitting in my trailer killing time. I'm like, sure, I'll mosey over there. And, you know, I don't know them well at all. And so it's nerve wracking a little bit. You're like, oh, I'm a guest on the show. I'm going to go see the, even though they're many years my junior, they're also my bosses <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> so I'm going over there and I go to the trailer and I, I must have asked Cliff or whatever. I'm like, which trailer? And they pointed and I went and I knocked and I knocked and I thought, well, the game must be too loud. So I opened the door. Which was a mistake because it was, I can't remember if it was one or two, but it was giant dogs, giant dogs yeah. who were right at the door. And it was like a comedy horror film where I'm like, <laughs> ah, and I closed the door as fast as I could. And literally like the blood drained from my face. These dogs were huge. Yeah. And you know how a trailer is yeah. because I'm lower and they're higher. They were at my face, yeah. you know? So I was like, holy crap. I'm like, that wasn't the trailer I was supposed to go into. I don't think unless they were setting me up to die. And I kind of moseyed over because both their trailers look exactly the same. And at that point, I'm not sure I knew which one was Jared and which one was Jensen. And so I went in the trailer and they were there drinking beer watching the game and i just i literally i was socially calm to them but inside i was literally having like fight or flight adrenaline rushes for the next half hour trying to calm down because it scared the living crap out of me confronting annoyed dogs by the way i don't mean cute cuddly dogs i mean hey somebody's opening the door and it's not our master let's get angry which is why i slammed the door Fat closed really fast. Scared the crap out of me. Never forget it. Last time I ever made a surprise appearance at one of their trailer doors. There you go. I'll tell you what. I announced myself way in advance from then yeah. on. 
Well, and then I, I had to endure the Packer game because the Cowboys kicked their ass. <laughs> It's, uh, there's no justice, Jerry. There's no justice. So, sure. uh, um, Rich, did you know after this episode, did you know you'd be back again? No, I had no idea. It was like everything else we ever did on that show, Rob. Yeah. Every time yeah. you yeah. did an episode, you had no clue. Yeah. Um, but, but I got to say, Richard, like amongst the fans and, and, and our crew too, you know, because we don't talk about like what episodes we like. And we were, everybody was such a big fan of the trickster, you know, like, because it, it just added a really nice element. Because I think our most successful elements always had the horror mixed with you know the humor mm-hmm. and um, right you know you're that was such a great character i mean when you came back as the uh in the porn movie that was just classic you know <laughs> it was just classic yeah but, they did give me some fun stuff to do i will yeah. say one thing about this one that stood out to me first episode first episode you're doing one episode then you get called back like oh wow i get to go do the character again that's cool and at that moment in time my wife was pregnant with our second child and i unbeknownst to me was sympathetically like a good husband also gaining (laughs) baby weight right right so (laughs) that when when this episode came i I remember putting on the costume and getting in there and shooting the scenes i watched the episode with my wife when it came out and the episode and i came on the screen and i think jc made an audible oh god (laughs) Like there, there was a, there was a, and I go, oh my God, that's not the camera, is it? I mean, that is the camera adding 10 pounds, like a different angle and a different angle. I'm like, man, that camera is real, be, really being thorough with its adding of 10 pounds. I, it was the, it was by far the fattest I'd ever been. And definitely in my face, the fattest I'd ever been. And I'm like, oh my God, what a train wreck. And then that's when the character really landed with fans and conventions kind of started so that then to this day, there's a trading card with a picture from that episode and like me holding a spike oh. and I have to sign it all the time. And I just, every time I'm like, God, damn, stupid God. That's as fat funny. as I mean, uh, I knew there's a reason this is my favorite episode of yours. <laughs> Dude, it's so awful. I mean, oh, I, I've got, my weight, like all humans is fluctuated up and down, but like, there yeah. was like definitely a high watermark. I live in peace, knowing it was for a good cause for the birth of my second yeah. child. But nonetheless, there you go. There you go. it's like, I love the fact that you never think about that when you're an actor. You're like, oh, I don't want to be seen on TV looking not my best, but what are you going to do? It's very yeah. different when that episode becomes cemented in the <laughs> vault of television programs for that series and becomes like trading cards and T-shirts. And <laughs> like, oh, and, and, thanks a and, lot. And lucky for you, Kim, you know, loves his tight close-ups. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I know. You, that, that whole sequence, I mean, your noggin filled the frame. <laughs> my noggin and all of my chins. Yeah, no, you, you, you know, but yeah. it was really effective. I mean, between, uh, you know, Kim and, and Tom Wright, uh, very similar. You know, they used to call him too tight right if you're a designer because, that's funny. you know, you don't really see a lot of the set. Uh, that's hilarious. But, that's but hilarious. but what you do see is is always, you know, he always does interesting stuff to get you there. But uh, yeah, that was also Kim's philosophy. If he had a good script, you know, he just, you know, pretty shot it pretty straightforward and and relied on, you know, the emotion to carry through. But if he got a script that he didn't like, he was going like, okay. Time to put lipstick on this pig, yeah. you know, yeah. and, you know, then he would bring in uh, the techno crane and, and bring in his, his toys yeah. because he said, I got to do something to make this interesting. Right. Turn, right. Turn out, turn down the page. Yeah. And, uh, that was the first time I heard that too. That, like you said, with this one, the script is just so good. Jeremy, Jeremy and what he does oh, yeah. works so well with what Jeremy's created. Yeah. Again, you know, the boys bought in, as you could tell, like every, every beat they were, they were full on, totally. and, you know, um, and I think Kim brings that confidence that he's not going to make them look stupid or this is going to be, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you're right. Uh, Carver was, you know, really making a statement mm-hmm. in this per- in this phase of Supernatural where Ben Edlund already had Jeremy Carver is now like landing these great episodes that were super yeah. clever and thought outside the box, you know, yeah. the, 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 the. I think the supernatural writers' room is the American graffiti of writers' rooms. Like it, it has generated so many yeah. class A writers who've gone on become giant showrunners and you know show creators in their own right. Like Robbie, absolutely. Sarah Gamble, yeah. Uh, Jenny Klein, Ben Edlin, obviously Jeremy Carver, Bob Barons, Bob Barons. Um, 
Steve Yaki. Yeah. The, go, the list goes on. Yeah. And, and they can't continue to uh, just show up everywhere. It's a real yeah. testament to the caliber of, of writers they were hiring and, and had the freedom these writers had to be as creative as they could be. I mean, I, I don't know what it was like in the writer's room, but whatever they were putting in the Gatorade was working. Yeah. You know? um, yeah, I think that must go back to Eric, though, too, right? Because I would assume. You know, yeah. He put that team together uh, for the first five years. Oh, and, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, if if it's anything like the free reign he gave us in the art world, then they had a lot of free, you know, you had a lot of room to hang yourself or be a hero. Right. Yeah. Because, so, Eric, you know, if you were doing something good, go for it. You know, Meredith Glenn, she's doing? just shooting out. She's show running a show in London. Andrew Dabb, you know, Robbie yeah. Thompson. So many great writers. Yeah. 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 It's really impressive. Uh, so, so here's a question that um, Easter eggs in the Groundhog Day set. And, I, and I'm I'm reading this directly, so you have to tell me if this is correct. Apparently, the placemats have groundhogs on them as like an homage to Groundhog Day. You know what? I fully believe that could be the case, but I don't remember. I don't, I, I don't I, either. I, you know, if Leanne was here today, I would ask her because she did the graphics for it, but um, uh, she's not here today. It sounds like something you would do. Oh, it's absolutely something that we would do. That's, right. you know, because we love that stuff. And it also sounds like it would come from the mind of Leanne, who's, you know, my graphic genius. Uh, you know, she just loves playing with that stuff. That's so. awesome. Well, let me ask you this. Let, let's, let, I'll, let me cast a broader net then. Was there, I mean, you're not afraid to spend some time in South Florida, but how much research did you have to do in that sort of vibe of these kind of mystery spot joints to really, you know, create what you thought it should be? How much of that was was just Free form creativity, and how much of that was research? No, a lot of that was research. You know, we we um, you know it was a variation on a theme, but um, you know it's a lot of optical illusions and things, and you know the the the, the table stuck on the ceiling, and and um, we did a bunch of different optical things um, that sometimes didn't get on on film. I mean, I remember the we had this really great looking mermaid uh, that was you know freestanding in in that. Uh, shop and um it was so uncanny that it looked exactly like one of our set dressers what? her name was osha i mean it looked like she modeled for this thing really and, um yeah and it was just um but i assume she didn't no she i not that she that not that she remembers <laughs> but you know you never know um, we, all, we all have our mermaid you, face you never know. Life. but we had you know a ton of different little bits in there but then when you when you do the story you know because it was supposed to be scary because they were they right. broke in like the first time and it was after hours and so you right. didn't see a ton of it and that was okay it was just that i know we fretted over that but so part of our process is we look at all these different weird tourist stops and then we look at which ones we think are fun and you know we go from there i mean the big jaws shark coming out of the wall that's very right. florida-esque uh we had another aquatic thing are those rental items like when you're doing that is that a thing you're renting or do you now own that like do you get stuck with all this quirky memorabilia yeah we get stuck with quirky memorabilia so what happened to it afterwards after 15 years of the show because i know you guys had that giant prop building attached to supernatural plus you had more storage elsewhere but after the fact oh, yeah. where, did, where does it all go well a lot of it just got thrown out you know because every year you because we accumulate so much stuff and we still only have a finite space so you bring in the dumpsters and you just recycle you go oh, do you think we'll ever use this again nope okay wow unfortunately because somebody just contacted me through my agent he goes look i'm designing my house and I love 70s stuff. And I was wondering if you have any of that cool 70s stuff left over from the show that I could buy. And I'm going to like, uh, no, <laughs> you know, too bad. I actually save, you know, the 70s furniture from uh, Supernatural. And Dude, there's plenty of stuff. I mean, I get why the, why the guy asked you, though, because I can you can walk into those sets and think, man, I want that sofa. I want that like you. There's some quirky awesome spaces remember the monte carlo i'm leaping episodes but remember the monte monte carlo hotel you guys built like for the for the for the loki yeah yeah oh yeah oh no, i mean i would a... i would kill to stay in that hotel like all everything yeah. in that joint i would have walked oh, out no, with. that uh, oh we spent some money on that you know yeah. and, that, and the tile floor and all that oh that was a uh, that was fun for us richard because we got to do something that wasn't just quirky it was very tasteful yeah you know? And that's uh, what I'm saying. The guy, these guy, people who want to buy your stuff, I get it, man. And, it's, it's really and of cool. Of course, you know, that's one of the, one of the only times we rented some really high end white furniture 
And I think it was, well, I know who it was, but somebody with a Sharpie sticking out of their pocket sat on the white couch. And now we had to buy a $15,000 couch. I, so, I remember that, dude, just so you know, because I yeah. was directing that episode. Yes, and I remember it, the order went out that no one was even to look at the sofas because it was white. Right. And I remember yeah. that happening. I don't remember. I do not know who it was. I just remember, of course, it got ruined. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and. Of course. What are you going to yeah, do? But, all, uh, all for the art, Jerry. All for yes, the art. It is. And, you know, I think they did okay, even with buying the couch. You know, yeah, I, I, I think that show did okay. It did it. We, we It survived the $15,000 couch purchase. Yeah. Um, thank you for being here. You'll be back. We love having you. Um, but thank you for doing this. Yeah, great. If you're a, a fan of Jerry Wanick and you want to see his work currently, watch Superman and Lois. He's hey. the product designer on that show and doing great work. Thank you very much. Great seeing Absolutely. you guys. Thank you, buddy. Hope I see you soon. This is Jensen stopping in to say hey and let you know that we've got to take a quick break. I'm about to pop. Thanks for supporting Supernatural then and now. And now, back to the show. I love having Jerry on, man. He knows so much about everything and he's such a charmer and what, yeah. what a what a great guy to have on and get his perspective on these great episodes that he has such a impact on. You know? yeah, when you think about like sort of the top handful of people that made this show what it is, he's up there. You yeah, because everything he did is on camera. Yeah. It's all right there. Yeah. And it's it looks amazing. I like when I asked him the question about the blood splatter and he was like, oh yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's a problem. Like, do you always have to, do you ever have to reset that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it sucks. Yeah, you know, it's, it's terrible. All right. So we've got a new segment for everyone right now. New segment. Are you ready? It's Supernatural by Artificial Intelligence. Not real intelligence. So what happens here is producer Steve Hine programmed into his supercomputer this episode of Supernatural and asked the AI, which I guess is the little gerbils in the machine, to create a synopsis of this episode. And it did exactly that. And now, I don't know if anyone's done that yet, but there are these AI chatbots, and you can basically type in a question, prompt, ask it to write a haiku, provide research, whatever, write a, write a college paper for you. It's kind of scary. But we asked it to write a summary of a fake episode of Supernatural. And now, Rob Benedict will read this review. It is, as we call our new segment, A Hole Reads AI. <laughs> All right, so we, we the prompt we put in was, can you write a fake summary of the television series Supernatural where Sam and Dean Winchester have to hunt ghost cats on National Napping Day? This episode right. of the podcast was released on Monday, March 13th, National Napping Day in the U.S. Here's the summary the AI came back with. In the latest episode of Supernatural, Sam and Dean Winchester find themselves facing their toughest challenge yet, a pack of ghost cats that are terrorizing the town on National Napping Day. As the brothers investigate, they discover that the cats are being controlled by a powerful witch who is seeking revenge against the town's inhabitants for mistreating felines. That might be a part for uh, Ruth Connell there. Mm. Armed with their trusty weapons and their wits, Sam and Dean set out to stop the witch and put an end to the ghostly feline menace. But with the cats multiplying by the minute and the witch's powers growing stronger with each passing hour, the brothers find themselves in a race against time to save the town before it's too late. As they battle their way through hordes of ghost cats and face off against the vengeful witch, Sam and Dean must rely on their brotherly bond and their years of experience as supernatural hunters to come out victorious. Will they be able to save the day and restore peace to the town? Or will the ghost cats and the witch prove too powerful for even the Winchesters to handle? Tune in to find out. It was just like our reviews, only spelled correctly with proper grammar. <laughs> Uh, this episode of Supernatural was, I say. was written by artificial intelligence. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> but, but you also, you read it better. Like, I feel like yeah. you yeah. were on your game. I feel like, yeah. I feel like you and computers relate better than you and other humans. <laughs> okay. That, okay. Well, I'm you're, sure. You, all right. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, but all the commas were in the right place. And like, I don't know. I really had a lot of help from, uh, the bot. So we might need the Steve Hine 3000 to, to do the <laughs> summaries. <laughs> As the buzz of the actual Steve Hine. There you go. That was our new bit. A hole reads AI. All right, mythology. I was really excited about that title for the segment. <laughs> I, I bet you were. I bet you were. <laughs> I loved watching your reaction as I was doing it too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you ready? Mythology. Yeah, you still got it, Rob. You still got it, kid. <laughs> 
And now it's time for mythology. 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 Mystery spots. There are typically anomalies at specific points on the globe defined by changes in gravity, time, and space. The most famous one is the Bermuda Triangle, where the USS Cyclops and its 306 crew members disappeared without a trace in 1918. There are numerous other incidents associated with the Bermuda Triangle. Yes, and there, also the Tahitian rhombus is a is a creepy, creepy area, a nautical uh, anomaly. <laughs> Be careful going through the Tahitian rhombus. A lot of, no one really talks about the Tahitian rhombus, but... I know! Don't yeah. you smell government conspiracy? Mm. I've got two words for you, brother. Cover up. Yeah, right. And there, of course, the uh, Peruvian square. <laughs> you know but, what it is? The Bermuda people have just had a... They've done a better job promoting their triangle. They, they certainly They're have. They're great. The, the Bermuda, Bermuda lobby is very effective. They get in there with our congressmen and women, and, and they, mm. they make their presence known. Whereas the Tahitian rhombus, mm. you know, the Tahitian people haven't... They haven't put it out there. Right. So I say now's the time. Uh-huh. And what's the other one you said? The what square? The Peruvian square. The, the Peruvian square. It's time for the Peruvian square and the Tahitian rhombus to get their day. Yeah. Yeah. Starts here, starts now. Right. We're going to start with us. Yeah. Why'd you tell the people about what happens near Japan? Well, man, I didn't want to get into this, but since you're forcing my hand, on the other side of the globe from the Bermuda Triangle, there's the Dragon's Triangle near Japan where there are similar stories of ships and planes disappearing. Dragon's Triangle is a pretty good name. Pretty it is. Good name. I feel like the dragons had a hand in this, though. Like, they were labeling it for themselves, because, like, Japan doesn't get any credit. Yeah. There's some dragon who's like, I've got a triangle. And so now <laughs> he gets the dragon triangle thing. And right. we know it's the dragon making the planes and the ships disappear. Duh. Yeah. You know, it's a dragon. That's what dragons do. So I don't know. The whole thing seems seems very heavy clawed by the dragon community. <laughs> uh, all right. The most fun ones, though, are the roadside attractions in the continental United States. There's the Oregon Vortex in Gold Hill, Oregon. You ever been to Gold Hill? I've not been to Gold Hill. And I, I feel like as a guy who goes to Oregon a lot, I should know this vortex. Well, certainly you've been to Confusion Hill in Piercy, California. I feel like I'm living there right now. But no, I haven't been. <laughs> uh, well, there's also the St. Ingens mis- Mystery Spot in St. Ignis, Michigan. That's a weird name for a town. So, uh, what, what is St. Ignis the patron, patron saint, saint of? of? Patron, saint, patron saint of words that are hard to pronounce? Look it up. I'm looking it up right now. Hold on. He is the patron saint of the province's... Of Gepuzkoa and Biscay, as well as the Society of Jesus. Huh. Makes no sense. Well. So he's the patron saint of the provinces of Gepuzkoa. Okay. I can't even saying it. The th- I don't know, man. Yeah. I got nothing. This is some good content. You know what? He's the patron saint of, you're, you're a jerk. <laughs> you know, another mystery spot is The Thing in Benson, Arizona. You're The Thing. And then there's, of course, The Mystery Spot in Santa Cruz, California. You're the do. mystery spot. <laughs> hey, I'm gonna about to turn your mood around because it's time for fun facts. Fun facts. Fun facts. This episode was shot to be a possible season finale because of the writer strike. Oh, the episode would have ended with Dean dead. Oh no! Wow, that's uh, scary. But it didn't happen that way. No, Jared Padalecki is famously quoted as saying is one of his favorite episodes to shoot because he got to team up again with one of his favorite guest stars, Richard Spade Jr. Wait, why don't you reread that? I think you... Oh, sorry. Let me put on my glasses. <clears throat> Jared Padalecki has famously been quoted as saying this is one of his least favorite episodes to shoot <laughs> because he had to spend a week getting into the headspace where his brother was killed. Yeah, it didn't but, look like he was enjoying himself. But I think what he meant to say was it was a true delight to be reteamed with Oh, His favorite no, guest I'm not Richard quite Spade. sure about that. Hmm. But there's a similar episode of The X-Files called Monday, where Agent Mulder keeps dying and waking up to relive the same day. John Chiban, who got a co-executive producer credit on Mystery Spot, wrote that episode of The X-Files. And Kim Manners directed both Monday for The X-Files and Mystery Spot for Supernatural. Mm, I smell cheating. I didn't know that. That, that changes everything. Cheat. And all- and they hashtag mentioned, cheaters. They mention X Files in this episode too. Yeah, hashtag don't don't care. Hashtag cheaters. Well, it sounds like you're, that's just the trickster talking. Hashtag shut it. 
Near the end of the episode, did you know this? Sam takes a sawed-off shotgun out of the trunk of the Impala. Did you see that moment, Robbie? Do you remember that moment? I think so. Okay, well, this is the same shotgun the brothers found in John's storage unit in Bad Day at Black Rock. Dean's first sawed-off shotgun, which he built in the sixth grade. Man, that makes me all sentimental for my first shot, sawed-off shotgun. Huh. And all my boys, when I gave them their first sawed-off <laughs> shotguns, it's just an emotional event between a father and a son. Just an iconic, you know, yeah. tale as old as time moment between right. a father and a son. Robbie, you remember when when you're, you're, you gave your boy your, his first sawed-off shotgun? I'll never forget. Yeah, same. Podcast producer Steve Hine was born and raised in Broward County, Florida. And yes, sa- listen, the first time that I will allow you in this country as a citizen, Rob. And says, it was never cold enough to see your own breath and definitely not cold enough to be wearing three layers of clothing. Yeah, so Steve Hine is, is crying foul on some of the details of this episode. And I don't blame I don't blame him because, you know, it's not accurate, but it's a hell of a lot closer to being accurate than Rob's pronunciation of the county, <laughs> which is just insulting to everyone. <laughs> It's a. It, it's literally it, why why Florida will never vote for a Democrat is your pronunciation of that county. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, uh, thoughts going out to producer Steve Hine, wherever he is. Uh, <laughs> well, listen, what a fun episode. What a great episode. It's just a, just a, a classic one for the vaults for sure. Yeah, for sure. Everybody loves it. Everybody, everybody, including Rob. Yep, that's right. Everybody wins. Thanks again to our... Patreon listeners, members. For, for oh, listening. man. Thank you, Patreon listeners, for coming in and checking out our live stream today and for just being supportive overall. And thank you to Jerry Wanick for being awesome and being here. Yeah. And, you know, thank you to everybody, even you, for listening wherever you're listening. We really appreciate you taking the time uh, to spend this hour. A lot with of people us. say, hey, I can't afford to be a member of Patreon. You know what? That's fine. The podcast is free. We love having you listen and be a part of our journey. Enjoy. This episode of Supernatural features Jared Padalecki as Sam Winchester and Jensen Ackles as Dean Winchester. Guest stars include Jim Beaver and Richard Spate Jr. Trey, I hope you put a lot of reverb on that. I'll do it again in case you need to try again. Richard Spate Jr. Yer, yer, yer. Mystery Spot was written by Jeremy Carver, story by Jeremy Carver and Emily McLaughlin, and directed by Kim Manners. Editing by David Ekstrom. Music by Jay Greska. Executive produced by Eric Kripke and Robert Singer. The original broadcast of this episode featured the following songs. Who Could Forget, Heat of the Moment by Asia, and Back in Time by Huey Lewis and the News. And they really crap all over Back in Time, don't they? Yeah, that's not cool. I love Huey Lewis and the News. Yeah, Great too. album. Great song. This episode originally aired on February 14th, 2008. Valentine's Day. Aw. Aww. This episode of Supernatural Then and Now was hosted and executive produced by Richard Spade Jr. and Rob Benedict. Produced by Stephen Hine, written by Stephen Hine and Hayda Holscher. And an edited and associate produced by Trey Booty. How about that, Booty? Music provided by Tim Wynn. The episode was recorded with the help of Sonic Fuel Studios. This podcast is from Story Mill Media. Follow the podcast on Instagram and Twitter at SPN Then and Now. And become a member of the podcast at patreon.com slash SPN Then and Now. Rob, thanks for joining Jerry and me in our podcast. It's <laughs> yeah, great having you, Rob. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Hopefully uh, we'll see you at a convention soon. For sure. Yeah, hopefully. I'll, t- I'll talk right. to you soon. Yeah. All right, Jerry, stay with me. Stay with me, Jerry. Don't go, Jerry. Story Mill Media. People are like, I mean, why don't you just go outside, raise a Canadian flag? Den- the biggest winner in the big game could be you, thanks to BetMGM. The king of sportsbooks is offering new customers a chance to score $158 in bonus bets instantly. That's right, instantly. Just download the BetMGM app and sign up using bonus code Vegas58. Then place a $5 money line wager on the big game. You'll receive $158 in bonus bets instantly, regardless of your wager's outcome. Don't miss your opportunity to cross the goal line on the money line as pro football's top teams clash for the championship. Can't be in Vegas for the big game? Then bring the big game excitement to you with the king of sportsbooks. BetMGM and GameSense reminds you to play responsibly. See BetMGM.com for terms. 21 plus only. Iowa only. New customer offer. Subject to eligibility requirements. Rewards are non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in seven days. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-BETS-OFF. That's 1-800-BETS-OFF.